Stay away from me. Stay away from me, you guys. Awful game. No. Get away. I don't want to play you. Get away. No. Please don't come any closer. No. could interrupt that little homage to Friday the 13th part 6 to bring you another overly long video about me bitching about a video game. I could be, you know, fighting crime or trying to find the guy who killed my Uncle Ben or maybe applying for a college, but no, I'm complaining about Final Fantasy games like an adult. And no, I'm not just some Final Fantasy hater, I used to love the series, I love the older games, and I like 8 even though it has a lot of flaws. But ever since 7, it's like Square Enix has been working harder and harder to make their stories and their characters worse and worse, and I hate it when a good series starts to turn in a way that's not really evolving and more so pandering. As you know, I hated Final Fantasy XIII. It's up there as one of my most hated games. Terrible characters, an incoherent plot, lousy gameplay, and the most linear, boring world I have ever seen in a video game. It's a piece of shit that should have stayed dead. But in typical Square Enix fashion, if it sells, give it a sequel, Final Fantasy XIII 2. Wow, cause, you know, the end of XIII just had too many loose ends. D did anyone want this? Who looked at the ending to XIII and said, there's just so much more I want out of this. The plot of XIII made no sense at all, but it wrapped itself up at least. Why did we need this? I know why. Cause this company is run by a bunch of assholes who would sell their children if it meant you bought a copy of Advent Children on Blu-ray. You fuckbags. The amount of money that was put into making this fucking game and we could have been using it for much better things. We could have donated it to the suicide hotline because anyone who plays this piece of shit would obviously want to kill themselves. We could have used that money to cure cancer but instead we made a game that causes cancer. Fuck this stupid game. But hey. This is a new chance to fix the world they invented in the previous game and improve the franchise by altering the gameplay back to how it used to be in the more classic RPGs that Square used to make. So how did it turn out? Well, I'll be honest, the gameplay is better. But the story is somehow even worse than the first one! How the fuck did you make a story even worse than 13? Well, I can sum that up in two words. Time travel. Oh yes, time travel. You know why? Because it worked in Chrono Trigger, and if it worked in Chrono Trigger, that means it will work in everything we try to shoehorn it into. It worked so well when you guys put time travel in 8 for no reason. So now you combine the convoluted writing for Final Fantasy 13 with the complexities of time travel. Fuck you. Just fuck you. That is just pure evil. So now here we are. Before we begin, I will make it known that I will acknowledge when something is better or worse than the first 13, but also remember that just because something is better than 13 doesn't mean it's good. Eating dog shit is better than playing Final Fantasy 13, but that doesn't mean I'm about to replace my Nutella with last night's kibbles and bits. But let's just get this over with. I introduce you to Final Fantasy 13 2. <laughs> oh god. Are you one of those people that loved lightning with her badass gun blade? Look at her kill these fucking guys. Watch her punch snow. Oh god, she's so fucking cool. She doesn't give a shit. She's an unstoppable killing machine. She'll take out anyone who's in her way. She's a total badass who kicked your ass so hard you'll be digging shoelaces out of your colon. She's not afraid. She's not a wimp. She's not in this game. No, not really. I can see why you would think that. After all, she is the only one on the fucking cover again. But no, she's in the first 10 minutes maybe, and then she's gone. You play maybe one battle with her, and that's it. Personally, I don't care, because I didn't like Lightning anyway. But it definitely is false advertisement to put her on the fucking cover and then start the game off with her if she's not going to be involved in the rest of it. In fact, the entire cast of the first 13 are barely in this. I mean, you see them every once in a while, but you never get to play as them. I guess I don't mind so much because I hated almost all of them anyway. The less I have to hear of Vanille's Lolita giggling, the better. So okay, if none of the cast from 13 is in this game, then who is? I'll have to ask my good friend, veteran actor Jeff Goldblum. So Jeff, 
Who do we play as in Final Fantasy XIII 2? Sarah! Who's Sarah? Oh, fuck. Her. Yes, our new main character is Lightning Sister Sarah. I can't say I understand why. Was anyone really demanding to play as Sarah? Probably not. No one was demanding this game in the first place. It's really weird, but I guess it's the best possible choice out of any of the other characters in this stupid universe. God knows no one is itching to play as Godot or, uh... Her or, uh... Yeah, this guy... And the names of this universe suck. So how is Sarah? Honestly... She's fine. I'm being serious. She's kind of sweet, but also determined and strong. She has hopes and displays a lot of bravery, even when she's scared. She makes efforts to help people, and you really learn how selfless she is as the game progresses. The total opposite of Lightning, who wanted to kill millions of people because some evil robot guy kind of annoyed her. Sarah isn't perfect, though. There are definitely times in the story where she comes off as an idiot and gullible, and don't even get me started on the stupid outfit they put her in. But... She's not too bad. I actually prefer her over Lightning. Sure, she's not a badass character, but at least she is a character and not some cardboard cutout like her sister is. At least there's something there. I can get behind that. Our next character is Noel. Wait, who the fuck is Noel? Oh. So he's the adult version of Sora from Kingdom Hearts? Nah, he's some dude from the future. Apparently, he's the last of humanity. Because he certainly looks like a guy who has dealt with nothing but the wild all his life. Well, Noel is... Okay at best. He has some optimism too, but it's not as visible as Sarah's because he spends a lot of time moping. He's definitely brave and does have a few badass moments. A refreshing thing about Noel is that he's actually fairly intelligent. He does make some rational decisions and likes to think a lot of things through. My problem is that he has so many irrational things to bitch about that it kind of weighs him down. He just broods a little too much, but he's not the worst. He's okay. Our next character is... Uh... Huh. Yeah, we don't really get one. No, I'm serious. You only use Noel and Sarah throughout the entire game. That's kind of fucking lame. Remember when you actually had a party of characters? Welcome to just having two. We have less characters than we did in Final Fantasy X-2. And fuck this game for making me bring up Final Fantasy X-2. No, the monsters do not count. And we'll get into those in a little bit, but I'm just going over the cast of 13-2 versus 13. This is better. I don't hate either one of them, and I guess having only two characters means we get some kind of development between them and see a relationship grow. They also gain a Moogle named Mog. No, he's not as cool as the Mog from Final Fantasy VI. He turns into a bow sword for Sarah so she can use him for combat, and Noel uses these dual swords. I will say that when I see Mog, it takes me out of the game a bit. A lot of that has to do with his design and him turning into a weapon. You may be thinking, but it's the classic Moogle design from the older games, and you're right. And if we look at another RPG like Skies of Arcadia, Fina's physical attack is her companion Cupel, who turns into weapons too. So why do I have a problem with Mog? One word, tone. This game has a severe problem with tone. Skies of Arcadia is a very light-hearted adventure game with a simple story, likable characters, and a colorful tone. Final Fantasy XIII 2 does have some light-hearted designs, but the story and characters take themselves way too seriously, and all the designs are so convoluted and complicated that a character like Mog really stands out because of his cute and simplistic design. You can't really take the game too seriously when it has goofy things like this, and I know what you're thinking. Oh, the early Final Fantasy games had goofy things in them in a more serious tone? You're right! Final Fantasy VII has a lot of goofy things in it, but it has a plot that can be taken very seriously. How come it was okay in that game, but not in this game? Well, here's the thing. Final Fantasy VII did not try to have a realistic design. Taking the mini character models out of the equation, the designs for the characters in Final Fantasy VII were very exaggerated. I mean, look at Barrett in Final Fantasy VII versus him in Advent Children. They look almost nothing alike because his design is so cartoony that trying to ground him in some kind of reality doesn't work. Also another big thing is the character reactions. I love the cast of Final Fantasy VII because of what defined characters they are. I can take all of them seriously but I also know they have over the top goofy reactions. 
Baron and Sid constantly lose their temper and swear up a storm, which adds some kind of levity to the story. There is also a lot of goofiness in the side characters. It's clear that from the characters' behavior and the designs, that we are placed in an exaggerated kind of world. So when you see moogles or giant chickens, it doesn't take you that far out of it. It feels kind of natural, especially if you're an anime fan. These types of things are kind of easier to accept. In 13-2, there's no real levity throughout the entire game. This game has way too many monologues, too many sad moments, too many long, serious speeches. And I'm sorry, I can't take any of this shit seriously when there's a flying Hello Kitty just in the background with the baby's voice saying Koopo Koopo over and over again. Maybe if Sarah and Noel lightened up a bit at some point, it would be easier to accept this stuff. Maybe if their reactions were a bit more over the top sometimes, we could accept all the goofiness around them. But no, they ignore and act like all this stuff is super serial, guys. Sheesh. Even villains like Kefka had more lighthearted elements to them than these two. But I guess I've gone off on a tangent. I guess despite the fact that I think the characters take themselves too seriously, they're fine. They aren't memorably likable, but they aren't memorably hateable either. I guess that's the best thing I can say about them. If you remember correctly, I really dug into 13 for having a bland and forgettable soundtrack that really didn't fit the series and came off as pretentious. Boy, I never thought I would miss forgettable. The soundtrack of 13-2 is so bad, it is laughable. The music in this game is so fucking lame. It's full of a bunch of shitty songs sung with really uninspired lyrics. It's fucking putrid. And is it me, or does it sound like this song is taken straight from Sonic Adventure? And if you thought the techno shit in 13 was bad, it's even worse here. Half of the music in this game sounds like some shitty dubstep song some asshole with big glasses whipped up in his spare time. Why did this become a thing in Final Fantasy games? I mean, yes, yeah, 7 had some kind of techno shit in it, but most of it was drowned out in orchestration. I think 8 really started this with Laguna's fights. I mean, listen to it. It sounds like Cher. It also introduced songs with lyrics. Granted, they only used it once and for one scene, and the song actually wasn't too bad. 10 is where it started getting ridiculous with this over-the-top heavy metal shit. But little did we know, it was building up to the most hardcore metal thing in the world. The most badass and heavy song in the entire existence of humanity. I'm talking about crazy goddamn motherfucking cunt punching choke him out! Are you fucking shitting me? I mean, don't get me wrong, I should be angry, I really should, but this song is so fucking pathetic, it's not even worth the effort to get mad. It's just hilarious that someone got paid to make this, someone got paid to sing this, someone got paid to write these lyrics. This is amazing! Oh man, I love how terrible it is. This is the type of song you put on to make fun of. Heavy metal chocobo songs, are you kidding me? What's next? Hardcore gangster rap chocobo songs? It would be like if someone made a rap dance number out of Zelda. <laughs> Jesus died in vain. 
Now, if we can go back to taking this kind of serious, the music in this game is awful. Most of the original songs in this game are dubstep or metal shit, and then a lot of it is carried over straight from 13. I'll give the title screen track credit, it sounded fine, but everything else is bad. This game even ends with another pop song, and if you thought the last one didn't fit, Oh man, this one is even more jarring. This may very well be one of the worst video game soundtracks I have ever heard. You can defend the story and characters all you want, fanboys, but you will never be able to tell me that this shit is good. The combat in this game is carried straight over from Final Fantasy XIII, so there really isn't too much to say about this. It's a bit more balanced than the last game, but it still sucks. You don't do anything in combat but switch formations and let the computer do all the work. I probably went 5 hours in this game just hammering the X button before I finally got to an opponent that required some kind of strategy. And even then, it's just switching formations and hammering X again. It's so fucking boring. I'll never understand how this system got the praise it did. There were times I would go in other rooms of my house to do things where I would bring the controller with me and just hammer X, then when I got back to my TV, I won the battle. You can literally win half of these encounters blindfolded. Also, this game still has the same star rating and point system bullshit the other one did, and it's even more useless here because it doesn't really seem to affect anything. What's really insulting is that the battles half the time say that their estimated battle time is only 30 seconds. Well then what the fuck's the point of it? How about you give me something worth fighting instead of wasting my goddamn time? Also, the star rating is so inconsistent. It can have an estimated battle time of two and a half minutes, and if I beat the monster in 30 seconds, I get a three star rating. The fuck? I literally beat the monster five times faster than you expected. And since the stars don't really do anything, I can only assume that this was put there solely to piss off the players. Fuck you, Square Enix! And just like the last game, all the monsters have convoluted names and the numbers are way too high. Why not, instead of 10,000 health for a common monster, give it like 1,000? And instead of my character doing 5,000 damage, he do 500. After 5 digits, it just becomes a numeric blur, especially at the speed these battles go by. So that's all the shit that's carried over from 13. What are the new features, though? Well, for starters, the monsters actually drop gill, which is nice. There are random encounters again, however, they aren't like traditional random encounters. They have a chance of being avoided if you can run away. What happens is that enemies suddenly appear on the map and you can either attack them with your sword to get a preemptive attack, which will start you off with haste and bring their stagger meter halfway up, or you can try to run away, but if they catch you, the retry option is locked. I actually think this is a good balance for random encounters, and it's definitely a more new age way to do it. I know a lot of gamers didn't like random encounters because they could be really annoying, and I do agree with that, but I also like the fact that they force you to level your characters. They stop you from being a gamer who just tries to rush through the whole game. Even Chrono Trigger, a game that had enemies on the map like 13, still had some sections where enemies ambushed you and forced you to fight. Oh, but Randy Spider-Man, how come you didn't mind the enemies on the map in Chrono Trigger, but you didn't like them in Final Fantasy 13? Because one, Chrono Trigger had tons of free space and areas without enemies at all, and it wasn't a fucking straight line. Two, the enemies in Chrono Trigger were not put there solely so you would be at the exact level the programmers wanted you to be at. And three, Chrono Trigger had a great combat system and 13s sucked. Even with the random encounters back, I'm still stuck using the same shitty combat system. Careful what you wish for, kids. Also, the range of these random encounters is bullshit. The monsters can be so far out of your circle, yet you somehow still get the encounter anyway, especially in Academia 400 AF. The random encounters are unavoidable and incredibly frequent, that just trying to make any sort of progress in a level is incredibly frustrating, with no way to turn them off. They should have let you buy monster repellent from the stores, like in the Pokemon series. Speaking of Pokemon, another new feature is monster collecting. It's this sort of Pokemon style system where you can catch a monster you encounter. Each monster is a certain class and has abilities that can be used, and they basically function as your third party member in combat. When you create paradigms, there is now this thing called paradigm packs that let you choose which three monsters you're going to vary between when you shift paradigms. It's actually not too bad, but why would anyone bother making one a saboteur or a synergist when Nolan and Sarah are much better at doing those roles anyway? I kind of just kept one as Sentinel because God knows I don't feel like being the damage sponge. One welcome change is that now if your leader dies, it's not game over. It brings you to the next leader. So if Noel dies in combat, you don't lose, you go to Sarah. Now if both of them die, it's game over. Why not just let us use the monsters? I don't see why not since they all share the same health bar anyway. I don't know. 
I guess I don't mind the monster collecting system, but a lot of the potential for it has been squandered. Yeah, you can customize them a bit by giving them these little hats and shit, but they don't do anything. They have no effect on them, they kind of just make them look cuter, I guess. But this customization is so limiting, you can't even name your monsters. Yeah, you can pick a name from a list, but that's it. Why? Why can't I just name the monster whatever I want? It's not like the characters ever say the monster's names anyway. Why can't I name these guys? I had such great names for them too, like this guy is Ecto Cum, and this guy is Satanic Puppy Dick, and this guy is the artist formerly known as Crazy Chocobo. Or Chocobitch, if that doesn't fit. But the worst part about these monsters is that every single goddamn one of them has their own fucking Crystarium to use. Fuck the Crystarium and this manual leveling bullshit they've been shoving down our throats since fucking 10. And just like 10, you level monsters up with items you get after combat. But what's annoying about it is that the monsters of higher classes need more rare items to level them. Why bother though when you can just take a weaker monster and level the fuck out of him with easy to find items? It's just a waste of time. My Twilight Odin went to waste because I couldn't find any items to level him with. I just leveled up one of those goblin hole ball fist things and he was just as good as Nolan Sarah. My dark elemental deity was outclassed by the green goblin. What the fuck? Getting back to the Crystarium, it's actually worse here than it was in the original 13. That's saying something. Sure, it's not as convoluted looking as the first game, and now it has shit hidden. You can't see what the next level in each class will bring you until you already do it, so you're stuck guessing what your best class would be if you want your characters to gain more health quickly. Each class learns skills at different levels, but most of them are hidden until you reach a certain threshold, so you can find yourself dumping a lot of unnecessary experience into a class that has little benefit to that character. What's worse is that it requires more and more experience after each level up, which wouldn't be so bad, but it's so unbalanced here. Let's say you level up Commando so much that your next level requires 1200 Crystarium points, then you realize you haven't started leveling up Medic yet. To get a level 2 Medic in this scenario, you will still need 1200 Crystarium points. The points needed for each level is consistent throughout each class. Why? Why not have each class individually get progressively harder? Instead of sitting on a thousand Crystarium points because I need 1200 to go to the next level in anything, why not let me use some to level Medic up a bit, or Sentinel, or any other class that's lacking? I guess I can't complain too much though, it's not like you've ever run low on experience. Leveling up classes is insanely easy. I maxed out my characters fairly early on without even trying. What's really annoying about the skills they learn is that they only go so far. There will be classes where after say level 40, there are no more skills to learn in that class. Well then what the fuck am I supposed to do with the other 59 levels? Really? You guys couldn't add more skills further down the road to encourage players to push that class further? You would think towards level 85 or 90, a Ravager would be able to learn Ultima or Meteor, but no, you get nothing for reaching level 99. You just get to go to the next class class and waste your fucking time. After you learn all the skills, leveling just becomes raising your stats one centimeter at a time and it's pointless. My characters were already pretty overpowered without pushing for those other levels. Now I just feel like I'm cheating. There's no difficulty in any of these battles. Sure, they can be time consuming, but not difficult. The only thing difficult is trying not to fall asleep as you breeze through the next 20 hours of the game with one hand mashing X and the other one jerking off. So I guess the combat is a little better than the first game, but it still sucks, and it still just makes me wish I was playing a better goddamn game. I feel so dirty. I need a shower. As you know, Final Fantasy XIII's world was pretty much non-existent. The whole world was nothing but a straight line for literally 20 hours of gameplay before you got to Grand Pulse, which sucked anyway because it was basically just a big sandbox with mediocre side quests that were meant to do nothing more than level grind and pad out the fucking game time. It was fucking awful. I hated it. Everyone hated it. That's why the common saying for that game was that, oh, Final Fantasy XIII gets good after 20 hours of gameplay. Which is a lie, because it sucked either way. So great, I guess Square Enix is going to do this to us again, huh? Is that...? No! It can't be! Oh my god, it is! It's open space! <laughs> God, this game isn't a goddamn tunnel. There's open space, towns and villages, and even shops. Oh my God, yes, this is a huge step forward. 
but honestly, it's still not that great. Each map is basically a sandbox of goals in different parts of it. Some maps will have other NPCs and some are just barren wastelands. Because of the time traveling aspect of this game, most of these maps are replayable in different time periods, so there isn't really all that much variety. It really boils down to the same handful of maps throughout the game. Sometimes you'll be able to explore more of a map in one time than another, but it's still the same map. What really sucks is that most of these maps have nothing to do with them outside of whatever story based missions are there. Sure, some of them have side missions but almost all of them are fetch quests that can be completed easily in the same map that you start them in. Half of the time you find them in one of these floating orb things. What jackass put a picture of his family in a floating metal orb? I think these orbs are glitchy. Sometimes they never even hit the ground. They just kind of float above it. Thankfully, unlike the last game, these orbs are only items. They aren't the save points or the shops. You can save anywhere and thank god there are actually shops in this game. Well, one shop, run by one person, in every time period. <laughs> I have no idea why. This is Chocolina, who is, uh, uh wow, alright, um, very casually dressed. Whatever, I'd fuck her to crazy chocobo anyway. But she's the shop in this game. She sells virtually every type of item, so there's no need for multiple shops, which I guess is convenient, but it sucks the life out of the world. Could you imagine how empty Hyrule Castle Town would be if all the shops and games were just two buildings? It would be a lifeless wasteland, which is what half these villages are anyway. Chocolina isn't even that great of a shop key because she almost always has the same shit. I bought new weapons from her and I didn't have another pair of weapons to buy for like 15 hours of the game and half the time the new ones she gets are weaker. Why the fuck would I buy those then? And no, they're not weaker because I need to upgrade the weapons. That stupid shit is fucking gone, thankfully. So what's the point in her getting weaker weapons? Remember in older Final Fantasy games where the weapons you could buy at the shop would gradually get stronger the further you progressed throughout the game? It was awesome seeing your attack damage go up the further you explored. And if Sarah buys a new weapon, does that mean she's buying another Moogle? Or does Ma get some kind of new paint job or something? No, because he looks the same. So how is he getting stronger? Maybe Chocolina is injecting Mog with some hardcore steroids. Heard you are talking shit, Kupo. So yeah, new weapons are rare, but buying shit in general seems to be kind of pointless. Most of it is shit monsters commonly drop. I barely spent any gill in this game because I just acquired stuff as I progressed from random encounters. Phoenix downs weren't really needed either because the game is really easy and learning the revive spell as a medic is also easy. So great, we have shops with nothing to buy. Yay, fun. I can't even pay for a prostitute in this game. The NPCs in this game are totally lifeless, they just stand awkwardly and have nothing interesting to say. Hell, half the time they'll just blurt things out as you're walking by. What's worse is that they only have like two or three lines and they just constantly repeat it every time you walk by. Okay, yes, chocobos are cute. I know, I want to fuck Chocolina in her choco nest. Got it, shut the fuck up now please. They're so annoying and poorly rendered. Maybe if they built a better world, the people could have interesting shit to say. If they wanted to do time travel, they should have done it like Chrono Trigger and had half these areas connected through some big map and then you visit these same locations in different time periods instead of this shit. It's basically a case of selecting your own empty sandbox. Yay, boring. This game does have a sort of golden saucer-esque type of place called Serendipity. It's basically a casino in some time paradox thingy. Oh yeah, because that's what anyone would do. The time guru at the end of time in Chrono Trigger really should have just opened up a fucking water park. But with that aside, this place is still boring. The games are far less interesting than the ones in 7. There's this random woman who offers you gameplay enhancements if you bring her fragments. But it only looks like she gives you these enhancements when she feels like it. Because I bring her fragments all the time just for her to say no. Fuck you, lady. This place also brings back chocobo racing, which I was super excited for because that was one of the most fun things to do in 7. But it sucks here. You don't really control your chocobo. All you really get to control is the boost, which drains quick as fuck. That's it. You can't even move them. Yeah, in 7 you can put them on autopilot, but you could also control them manually. Also, 7's tracks were fucking awesome. They took you through caves and rainbows and fucking space. This is going in a circle over and over. 
Great, it's Chocobo NASCAR. As if this game wasn't boring enough, the rewards you get for winning aren't all that great either. They're really basic or pointless shit. Also in 7, the Chocobo races were only half the fun. The fun in 7 was catching and breeding strong Chocobos at your farm, making them stronger, naming them, giving them their own sense of identity, bringing them with you on your adventure. They'd give you access to things in other areas that even your ship couldn't get to. Then you could race them in the colorful fun area with tons of shit to do with that rocking fiddle music. Winning a race is seeing all your hard work pay off and ending up with a gold Chocobo. This is depressing and lifeless. You took the wonderment of chocobo racing and made it boring. Yeah, thanks. I suppose if Square Enix did Lord of the Rings, they get rid of all those pesky action scenes and just turn it into a movie of guys walking. I get more life out of Andy Warhol's movie Empire, which is literally just a still shot of the Empire State Building for eight hours. I can at least laugh at the fact that behind the camera we have some jackass who thinks he's making art. Here I get angry because this company used to make some of the best games ever with hours of additional content that offer rewards, but to be fair, the environments in this game are really nice looking at the very least. Academia looks pretty, even though the architect of this place was totally on shrooms when he designed it. Maybe this place would benefit from some more railings. If someone trips, they're as good as fucking dead in this game. They'll fall and get hit by a flying car. Wait a minute, flying cars? Is it me, or does this place look like Coruscant from the Star Wars prequels? I don't like sand. Oh, God damn it! It's not even as good looking as the Star Wars prequels, because this game has a serious issue with frame rate lag. Whenever there's a lot of stuff on screen, it slows down. I understand why, but maybe then don't program it so poorly. Have things load in the background. Wind Waker was able to do all that stuff back in the GameCube days, and it looked great. Hell, most modern games can load stuff in the background and not have this shitty lag, so why doesn't this game? Navigating a lot of these places can be annoying because there seems to be invisible walls everywhere. I can't jump from one ledge to a lower one most of the time because there's a fucking invisible wall. You're just limiting my roaming capabilities with all this bullshit. It really feels like they went out of their way to limit your freedom. If I wanted no freedom, I would have moved to North Korea. Alright, look, for all my bitching, I'll be the first one to say that this is a lot better than 13. But that doesn't make it good. It's simply not as bad as the last game. Hell, it's probably better than 10 as well, so take that for what it's worth. It's not the worst, but it ain't anything special.